secretaries, first, first and foremost and then last, um, I want to say again in front of friends and members of our community a thank you to Marjorie Perloff for making the trip and being with us for a number of days. This has been a huge treat. So Marjorie Perloff, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Al. I wanted to start by just uh, celebrating the fact that in 19, at the Northeast MLA in 1985, can you imagine? The Northeast MLA, which was probably in Boston that year, in 1985, you gave the keynote address. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you did. Well, I don't know if it was the keynote address. I don't even know. You did. You did. Okay. You did. I have evidence of it, actually. Evidence of that is in poetic license. Um, the first of these essays, which is a pretty famous and maybe even infamous essay, um, uh, canon to the right of us, canon to the left of us. And right and left means sort of what you think it does, but also n what you don't think it does. And um, anyway, at the end of this talk, which became an essay published somewhere else and then became collected in this book. At the end of this talk, which is really a chastising of a bunch of um, high-toned, th theory-obsessed people who were writing, who were putting together a collection of essays about the lyric, and you noted a few things, such as that they don't really know anything about actual lyric poems, they um, hardly refer to American lyric poetry tradition and so forth, and that they're remaining at a fairly high level and that you like to read poems and talk about poems. And at the end of this thing, almost from nowhere, you have a page-long um, idea about how the emergent, you didn't say the word internet, but how the emergent use of what we now call digital media would shape the future, might shape the future of the lyric. And it's, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, and I'm not sure what question there is in here, but I just wanted to celebrate the fact that in 19, it was probably written in 84 and delivered in early 85 or late, late 84, and you're talking about how uh, we live in a technological world. Uh, you talk about the disruption of linguistic and syntactical order that we find in Lynn Hygienian or Charles Bernstein, who's here with us today. Uh, uh, that the discourse of technology is going to finally catch up with some of the, uh, these ideas. This is in the uh, early 80s. Uh, and that um, new technological language uh, is going to be involved. Videotape playback, I love that phrase. <laughs> the telephone answering machine and the computer, especially in its capacity, comma, via modem, comma, to address <laughs> other computer terminals. Um, and so, I mean, we can laugh at this because, but there you were at, yeah. at this MLA talking about how this emergent technology, most of us were just learning, you know, the earliest email. So I don't know what the question is other than, you know, <laughs> congratulations on your prescience because this, be, this has become a very <laughs> important thing to you. And so, do you have any comments on being so prescient? And <laughs> I was there at this, I was there at this meeting and, and, well, you remember the essay. I, I, I guess I remember the essay. <laughs> you know, it's really awful when you go back and look at things that you wrote 20 years ago, 30 years ago. First of all, people are always calling you on it and right. saying, well, you said, you know, <laughs> right. when, when you've said it 30 years ago. Why end an why end an essay mind. about but the lyric I think that way? at that time, if I remember the situation, the person that influenced me so much in those years was John Cage, still does. You know, I just loved Cage's work and what I, I loved silence. Those were like my Bible in some ways. And what one thing I liked about them is that Cage, without being at all some kind of technophile and science fictiony right. person, or uh, today it would be video games, felt that the technology is here. We have to live with it. We have to learn to live with it. And I had been to his house uh, quite a bit uh, downtown, the old Altman building, where he had a whole room that was a computer room, mm. as a matter of fact. In he Cage's had a house. room. He had a room that was a greenhouse that he watered the plants every day. It was a huge room where you would think you were in the country somewhere. And then the other room was a kind of technology room. And so it was the idea of fusing technology and nature and that nature needn't be the enemy. And you know, this was the period where most critics, still is true, academics hate technology, um, even as they use it all the time, but it's horrible. It's all a sign of late monopoly capitalism, you know, and want to get away from it and so forth. And I always felt, you know, That's you the can't, canon to the left of us, yeah, I guess. You right? can't, you <laughs> can't get away from it. It's here. And Cage told the wonderful story about, um, with somebody buying a house in Ireland in the middle of nowhere and thinking, ah, they've finally gotten away from technology and then the planes are always flying overhead. Mm -hmm. So there's no way, you can't get away. And on the contrary, therefore, you might as well try to learn how to use it without it taking uh, over your life. I'm not so sure I totally still <laughs> feel that way because I also think that um, 
the internet has has it, it's a it's been a mixed blessing. Mm. My way. favorite moment in the book, other than that, is it comes on page fifty at the beginning of the Brazilian concrete poetry chapter, where you quote Kenny Goldsmith, uh, giddy about having gone to a um, a panel on concrete poetry and saying basically, "Wow, it took the inner it took our internet consciousness to get to the point." where concrete poetry seems now to have a, re uh, there's an audience going to be receptive to it because of that, though in the 50s, when it first started happening, we didn't, so how great I is it? And then you go on to say, um, yes, and concrete poetry has been, ha has it's had a hard time finding its place in the academy because, and you say the word department, because departments, an English department or comp lit department would think of it as a visual studies thing, and the visual studies guys would want to make it into a design thing. And so this leads me to ask you, really ask you to comment on any of that, the way you opened that chapter, but to ask you particularly about this whole problem of the academic uh, compartmentalization that really makes it difficult for this kind of work to find its way into the academy. I don't think it's only the academic um, compartmentalization in the case of concrete poetry. I think it's, it's a national thing in many ways. In the United States and in England, especially in England where they still think concrete poetry is just a game. Like right. sort of a game, silly. Although they've had their own great people like Ian Hamilton Finley, Evan right. Morgan, they have some of the great yeah. visual poets. But in general, there is still the Anglo mood and that has hit. It's certainly true in America. It is not, not so much an academic thing as it would be true in the New York Review of Books. It would be true in the New Yorker. It would be true in those things that Concord Poetry isn't considered anything. It's just fun and games and uh, you're playing around and we all do that. We all do these little games, but that's not poetry. So, um, and there are a lot of, you know, reasons behind that, that the whole Anglo tradition is so strongly geared toward a mm. certain kind of meaning and a certain kind of a poem making a certain kind of statement or expressing a certain kind of feeling that um, I but think it's, it's still true today. It's a little I ironic that the Academy would be particularly resistant because of departmental arrangements. Um, given that there should be a certain extra open-mindedness. It's not that, that they do it in the art department. I just want to make that very clear. Mm. It's not that they talk about concrete poetry in the art department. I remember at UC Santa Barbara, Harry Reese has, has a sort of, in creative studies, which is a separate school at, at Santa Barbara, has a bookmaking group, you know, a book group and that kind of thing. And there they talk about concrete poetry. Mm -hmm. and that's a, but mm -hmm. that's considered a sort of, you know, déclassé minor group, mm -hmm. book work, you know, this, mm -hmm. this sort of thing. It's not taken very seriously. So um, I think, you know, and I have the quote in my book by Elizabeth Bishop, where she was Fantastic. in Brazil and makes fun of concrete poetry. And oh, those people, Augusto de Campos, oh, they, I mean, you know, they don't know quite what they're There's doing. A letter and written course, by Bishop to Lowell in 1960. And they're so well educated. And so that is an interesting thing. And there I do feel I was, I was prescient in some ways because today when we do see things on screen mostly, how can you ignore the look of a poem? It doesn't have to be a concrete poem. But any poem, the look on the page or on the screen, just the sheer look is going to be central to the work. Why wouldn't it be? That's just how you see it and perceive it. And there's so many things you can do with the look rather than have just a straight column, which we think of, we used to think mm -hmm. of as a poem. So that that shift really came much earlier. It came with Pound, for instance. And um, one of the best things I remember reading on that is Hugh Kenner's The Mechanic Muse, which is about how the typewriter changed right. poetry. Right. And you can you can see, well, Yeats, I've done a lot of work on Yeats, and I love Yeats, but Yeats, of course, wrote longhand, and then the poem would be typed up. And there's a huge difference between people who write longhand, or used to write longhand, and people who wrote for the typewriter. Like Williams. Because when you write for the typewriter, like Williams, but Pound was one of the first, oh, you're going to set a word over here, or in italics, or it's going to be an ideogram, or it's going to be something to see that you don't really hear that way. 